my name is Peter Hogan, as you know, and I'm Freddie's business partner, and we're co-founders of Property Millionaire Academy. Now, we'll get into what that is later and what it can do, but I want to ask you a question. And the question is, I don't need that mic, right? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, we don't need a mic. Mic's for wimps. <laughs> right. Who knows the secret of success? Nobody. Who'd like to know the secret of success? It should be all of you. Come on. Who'd like to? Right. Um, it's a funny thing though because why is it that some people are successful in things they do and, um, and other people just fail or they just plod through life? Why is that? Because I'm going to tell you something. It's nothing to do with how intelligent you are or what education you had or who your parents are, it's got nothing to do with that. It's something else. And there is a secret to success. I might have missed one there. Eh? I've got to tell you, the secret to success is self-belief and focus. And a bit of hard work thrown in. Now you're probably thinking, oh, is that it? Self I knew that. But if you know it, why aren't you, why aren't you successful? Why aren't you successful? Or maybe you are. But I'm assuming that you'd want to be even more successful or you wouldn't be here tonight. So what gives people the edge? What makes people what they are? It goes back a long way. It goes back to when you're born. Now, we have two minds. We have a conscious mind, the one that you think with, the one that you're listening to me with now, and we have an unconscious mind, a subconscious mind. And when we're born, they're both empty. And it's life's experiences that fill your minds, particularly your unconscious mind. And that's the one that that gives you the experiences that makes your story. Everybody has a story. Freddie told you his story. I'm going to tell you my story. Your story shapes your life and it makes you what you are. For better or for worse. Your story starts the day you're born. I just said that. Right. Self-belief and focus. If you've got a pen, I want you to write that down. Self-belief is a fuel that powers the vehicle of your success. Without self-belief, you're not going to achieve anything. Because if you don't believe you can do it, if you don't believe in yourself, who else is going to? Nobody. You need to self-belief. You need to believe that you can be completely successful. Because if you don't, you're going to fail. We've got a problem there, I don't know what that is. I've lost, I've lost what my next slides are. Let me explain something to you. If you start a project and you're not sure about it, how much effort are you going to put into it? Maybe not a lot. So let's say you're starting a project. And it doesn't matter what it is. You could be training for a sports event. You could be starting a relationship. It could be starting a job or a new business venture. It doesn't matter what it is, but you're starting a new, a new project. Now, at the end of it, you're going to have a result. For better or for worse, you're going to have a result. Now, that result is influenced by your story and I'll explain if you're the kind of person who says yeah I'll have a go at it but it's probably not going to work because it never has before and I, I know me I know what I'm good at and I'll have a go then how much effort are you going to put in to that project yeah, it's all right for him. It always works for him, but you know, for me, I've got, I've got no luck. 
If you go into anything with that kind of thought process, that kind of limiting attitude, you're not going to you're not you're not going to you're not going to succeed at it, or not succeed well. And the problem is that that then confirms your story, and you say to yourself, "See, I knew it wasn't going to work out. I knew it wasn't. Why did I bother? I knew it wasn't going to work out." And the problem is that the next time you go into a project, you've got that in your mind, and you think, "See, it didn't work last time. Why is it going to work this time? I'll give it a go, but..." And you're into an ever-descending spiral of negativity and limiting beliefs. If, on the other hand, you went into your project and you knew 100% you were going to fail, you were going to succeed, I pick upon. If you knew you were going to succeed, then you're almost certainly going to. And that's the difference. And let me ask you a question. If you woke up tomorrow morning and you knew with 100% certainty that everything you were going to attempt, you were going to be 100% successful at, how would that make you feel? You'd be a different person. You'd walk differently, you'd talk differently, you wouldn't worry about who you spoke to, you'd negotiate deals, you'd be a completely different person. You know what? You can do that, you can be like that. And we'll show you how. So everybody's got a story and it's all the experiences in childhood that make you what you are. Now all added together, they, they produce you, but sometimes one, one episode, one thing can have a massive effect and it can be a big event or it can be one single word. And I'll give you an example. Those of you old enough, you remember the carpenters, the singing duo of the carpenters, right? Just say yes. Yeah. Karen Carpenter and Richard Carpenter. Now, during the, they were massive. You've never heard of them. They were massive, massive all over the world. And in the 70s, while they were still at college, they, were, they did a show in Los Angeles. And there was a reporter there from the Los Angeles Times. And he wrote an article for them for the paper. And they were about 17 or 18 at the time. And the, the reporter described Karen as Richard's plump little sister. That one word destroyed her. She became anorexic, bulimic, it destroyed every relationship she ever had, and in the end it killed her. One word. Plump. I'll tell you my story. My story did a lot of things in my life, but this is the main story, the thing that shaped me and made me the successful person I am. And it was in 1953. I was five years old. And my mother came into the bedroom. It was, hot. it was August, a very, very hot morning. My mother came into the bedroom and woke me up. And she had that look on her face. You know that stern look mothers get? When you don't say, you know something's wrong. You know you've done something wrong. You know you're going to be apologising. You just don't know what for yet, right? Come on, get up, get up. Why? Where are we going? Get up. I had two sisters. I was five. I had a three-year-old sister and a one-year-old sister. So my mother got us dressed. She put the youngest one into a little push chair. She put clothes and things in carrier bags and we left the house. And we started walking. And we walked for about down, down the streets for about two miles. Came to some country on the outskirts of the town. And I remember we were a little path, barely wide enough to take the pram. And my mother was going hard. And... Uh, Myself and my three-year-old sister were running behind her, trying to, keep it, trying to catch up. We went along and the, and the road, the, the path turned through the fields, turned along the side of a river. This was Manchester, the river was the river Irwell. And it was very, very heavily polluted. It didn't flow so much as oozed. And it was a thick brown with a thick yellow scum on top. And the sun was beating down and to this day, I can remember the smell coming off that river. Nearly made us sick. And we followed on, and my mother wouldn't answer, she wouldn't say anything. We walked for about five or six miles that morning until we came through some fields to a long road. It's called Ratcliffe Road, long straight road. And right opposite, on the other side of the road, was a row of terrace houses. Terrace was a nice way of putting it, it made the stuff on Coronation Street look palatial. 
In the middle was one of the houses, number 201, 201 Radcliffe Road. My mother went up to it and opened the door and we went inside. And hot as it was outside, it was freezing inside. We went in and the front door opened straight into the living room. And on the floor was stone flags. There was no covering on it, no carpets, stone flags. On one side, on the left hand side, was a tiny little fireplace, about nine inches by six inches. Right in front was a door through to the kitchen with some stairs going up across the house. Inside the kitchen was another a small kitchen, stone flags. There was one white sink, one cold water tap, a gas cooker with three rings and one cupboard. That was it. Upstairs, at least there were floorboards, but it was still cold and nothing. I remember the walls were kind of lime green, emulsion painted. <coughs> Horrible. That was when I found out that my mother had left my father and this was to be our new home. Now we were kind of quite well off. My father was uh, an inspector in the Greater Manchester Police and we did all right. I went to pre-private school and uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a rude shock to, to find that happening because I left my friends behind. I never saw my friends again. Never got a chance to say goodbye. I never saw my father again or heard from him from that day on. This was to be our new home. On the other side of the road was a paint factory and my mother had got a job there and the house was a tied house as it turned out. Now she worked there but it didn't give her enough money to support us so she got a job in the evenings in a pub and at the weekends in a pub which didn't leave her much time at home to look after her family and particularly my two younger sisters. So who do you think looked after them? I was five years old. I had to do everything. You won't believe it. I learned pretty quickly. We had to go to Laundrette. It was a 45 minute bus ride each way. I only ever had one pair of socks. And when I went to Laundrette, I couldn't have, I couldn't wear any socks because they were in the bag. Getting, getting, getting washed. I grew up in absolute poverty with nothing. A treat for us my mother would buy, once a year, my mother would buy a Mars bar and cut it into three. And we got a third each. There was no money for toys or anything. If I wanted anything, I had to make it or find a way of getting it. And if I didn't, I didn't get it. And that's when I started learning about success. Not consciously, I wasn't thinking about success or anything like that. I just knew I couldn't afford failure. I could not afford the luxury of failure. I had to make or get what I wanted. I became very self-sufficient and I learned how to make things happen. Now you've heard that expression, success breeds success, and it does. Because I got into the habit of making things work and making things happen. So I didn't have no choice. And that made me what I am today. I don't think I've ever failed at anything in my life. But varying degrees of success but I always make things work and I always make things happen. And um, it's how me and Gus said today that there's a downside to that, which I'm not going to go into it at the moment, but um, that there's positive sides as well. Now, when I was 20, I grew up in Manchester and I could have gone either way, good or bad. Uh, I, you know, no, no father, no father figures to look, uh, look after me. My mother really had no control, but I had to look after my sister. So that was kind of, it was, it was a hard upbringing. When I was 20, I just upped to six and went to live in Jersey. And I lived in Jersey for the next 27 years. And I did very well in Jersey indeed. To the point that um, uh, one day I was sitting in, in, in our house in, in St. Helier, in St. Saviour in Jersey, and I'd just paid off the mortgage. And I was sitting there watching TV. I'd come home from work, it was one evening. And my wife was sitting there. She got home and away on TV, I remember that. And I just read the evening paper, put it down. And I was sitting there musing like that. And I suddenly I got a thought in my head and I thought, why don't I buy another property and rent the rooms out? Easy. So I picked up the paper and looked through and um, there was a house there for sale in St. Helia for £24,000. That one. 14 Museum Street. It was, it was a three bedroom house with a reception but the loft had already been converted so I could get five rooms into it. That was my first taste of, that was in March in 1986. My first taste of being a property investor. Now in those days, there was no information. There was no meetings, there was no books on property investment, 
Nobody knew anything about it. I just had to learn it and figure it, which is what I did. And I just, I just did not to do. So I thought, I'll go and see my solicitor. So I went to see my solicitor and told him what I wanted to do. And I'll never forget his words. He said, um, I've got a client who's got some money to invest. Would you like me to have a word with her? It was a lady. I said, oh, yes, please. So he called me back a week later and he said, oh, I've got some good news. You can have as much as you want, up to a million pounds, on a drawdown facility at 10%. Now, the bank rate in the UK at the time was 16%, so 10% was fantastic. So within a week, I bought that house. Four weeks later, I bought another one, £35,000 in Sierra Elia, all with this lady's money. And I'd stumbled unwittingly on the strategy known as OPM, other people's money. I'd never heard that phrase before. This was long before Danny Vito's film, Other People's Money, but I found out about other people's money. And I built a port property portfolio with no money of my own. I was only paying 10%. The bank rate in the UK was 16. I was doing very, very well. I used to go home to my wife at night and I used to say to her, you know what? This is so easy. Why isn't everybody doing it? I couldn't believe that all my mates weren't piling in and doing the same thing. I was raking it. I was so much money, it wasn't true. I went a bit silly. You know the gold Rolex, it cost about 26 grand today. In those days, 1986, it cost four grand. I had two, identical. What's the point of that? I didn't even wear them in case I got mugged. <laughs> but since then, I've also found that it stands for something else as well. That was other people's money, other people's mortgage. And this is another strategy I came about. I think somebody mentioned that um, um, Matthew earlier mentioned lease options. Now, in the beginning of 2010, I bought a book called The Art of the Deal. And I was reading through this book, and it was amazing. You, you know, a light bulb moment? I'd like a million light bulbs go, go at that time. I'll tell you who the author was. You might have heard of him. He's a guy in Manhattan in New York called um, Donald Trump. <laughs> and I was reading this book. And I was amazed at what he was doing. He was getting property all over New York. He became a billionaire in the process. He didn't buy a single property. He controlled them with a contract. The contract was called a lease option. And I was like, wow. I couldn't, I couldn't believe what I was reading. I thought, if he can do it, I can do it. And if it works over there, it's got to work here, right? Right? Yeah. So I thought, I'm doing that. Free property? Dead right. Get me some. Now I need a contract. Went to see my solicitor, never heard of a lease option contract, couldn't write one. I couldn't find a solicitor to write a contract because at that time, early 2010, pretty well nobody in the country was doing lease options in residential property. I finally find a solicitor and between us we cobbled something together. And I didn't really know what a lease option was or how it worked. Because he doesn't go into it in detail in his book, Donald Trump. He just assumes the reader knows because it's an American book. But by about June, July of 2010, I thought I've got what I want. And I got in my car and I, was spent, I spent the next six months driving around the country. I went to a state agent after a state agent trying to get a lease option deal. I didn't get any. Not one. I got knocked back more times than I can remember. And six months of that, is enough to dampen anybody's appetite, right? A lot of people would have given up after a couple of weeks. They'll think, oh, that's not going to work. I knew it wasn't going to work, right? But I knew it was going to work. I just didn't know how I was going to make it work. So over the Christmas New Year of 2010-11, I sat down and they dissected everything I was doing. And I thought, I've got to find a way of doing this right so I can get the deals. And I came up with a complete new strategy, new negotiation, a new way of approaching uh, estate agents and at the beginning of January 2011 I went out again. I visited a lot of the previous estate agents that I've previously seen. In the next seven months I did 48 lease option deals. I got 48 properties in seven months. Four million pounds worth of property in seven months. And the most I paid for any single property, in fact it was, it was two, it was two flats in a block of flats in Leeds that I got from a tied investor and I got the two of those for 55 quid total cost. 
and that includes the fuel to drive to Leeds to see them. That's the most I paid. I made a fortune out of lease options, free property. To date, I've done 94 lease option deals. I'm not stopping yet. I'm not saying that to brag about doing lease option deals. What I'm saying about it is that you can't give up. Any damn fool in the world can give up. It doesn't take guts and integrity and tenacity to give up. Anybody can do that. You get the results when you keep going. I kept going. I didn't give up after six months of driving around the UK. I made it work. And I've made everything I do work since. And, it, and it's fantastic. Um, incidentally, it was interesting, while well, I just think about it, it was interesting hearing that guy talk about cryptocurrencies, wasn't it? Anybody know much about cryptocurrency? Who, who gets the HMO magazine? Well, is, he, is uh, Cuthbert still in here? Is he outside? Cuthbert, the guy who introduced me, is the editor of this magazine. And this particular magazine here is this month's issue. And you see it's all about cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency and property. Written by me. So I've got my fingers in a lot of pies. I do a lot of different things. And um, there's no getting away from the fact that cryptocurrency is here to stay and is going to make a lot of money for a lot of people. Don't ignore it. We're, we're a forward-looking company, the Property Millionaire Academy, and we're the first property company in the country to actually take cryptocurrency as, um, as, as payment for, for our things. So, that's how I find out about lease options. Incidentally, if you don't know what a lease option is, and you might get by now. It's a way of taking control over a property without actually buying it and making a lot of money. So it's virtually, virtually free, free property. They are. So, it doesn't matter what your business idea is. It doesn't matter how good you think you are. Like I said before, it doesn't matter what your education is or anything like that. Ultimately, it comes down to the law of attraction. You're either attractive to money and success or you're not. And if you're not, you're going to be one of the people who struggle. Now, I talked earlier about your experience in life that shape you, that become your story. And put your hand up if you've got a job. All right. You can all blame your parents for that. Because ever since you were that big and growing up, what have they said to you? Work hard at school, get a good job, you'll be all right. And you worked hard at school and you got a good job and now you're all right. But now what? You're in a job. J-O-B, just over broke. And it doesn't matter whether you get a rise or you might get a job with a bit more money, your, your lifestyle will encompass the extra money, you'll spend the extra money. You will not become wealthy because you've got other limiting beliefs, what are called limiting beliefs in there. Your parents have said to you, money is the root of all evil. The filthy rich. Money doesn't grow on trees. Money can't buy happiness. And it sinks into your unconscious brain. And on an unconscious level, you're constantly making a decision. Money or happiness. You don't realise you're doing it, but that's what you're doing. And almost always, you're going to take happiness, not realising that you can have both. And let me tell you, money does buy happiness. It buys shed loads of happiness. Buys as much happiness as you want. It doesn't buy love, but it's surprising that when you're rich and happy, how quickly love comes along. Because <laughs> who, who wants to be married to somebody who's poor and miserable, right? So yes, money can buy happiness, shed loads of it. And you can have both. And the thing is, that once you've got money, you can help other people. And that's the real Thing. That's the real joy of money, is being, healthy, being able to help other people. You can't do that if you're poor and miserable. You owe it to yourself to become rich. But you're not going to do it while you've got these self-limiting beliefs in there. And on an unconscious level, you're making the choices. You need to be, to be, to be able to identify those beliefs and get rid of them. 
And that's what we do on our Money Magnet Day. On one day we can turn your life around completely. We can help you to identify what those limiting beliefs are. And we can help you to get a new grasp on reality. It's amazing and it happens. We had a meeting last Saturday, it was our last one, Freddie. And we've got, well, let's see if we, what, oh, it's, it's, it's at Milton Keynes. The next one, by the way, make a note of that. Saturday, 31st of March at Milton Keynes at the Hilton. You don't want to miss that. You do not want to miss this day, it's amazing. That's what, you, that's what you're going to learn on the day. You're going to learn that, how to maximise your self-belief. How to switch off your chimp. Do you know what your chimp is? That's your chimp. Nobby. He sits on your shoulder. You've all got them. I can see him on everybody's shoulder. He sits there like that and this is a guy who turns around and says, yeah, that's no good. That'll never work. You can't do that. Ah, it's alright for other people. No good for you. Right? Nobby. So our chimp. Our chimp. We've all got a chimp. The, the people who's putting doubts in our mind. Who's saying you can't do it. It's not going to work. Let somebody else do it. Pack it in. Take the easy route. This is our, uh, your chimp. You've got to get rid of your chimp. Nobby. Kick him into touch. Right? Because as long as you're listening to him, you won't, you won't do anything. How to switch off your chimp. How to create the confidence you need to move forward. How to attract success and money into your life. How to be successful in everything you do and how to immediately make a massive change in your life. Because you know what? Life, everything in life goes in a straight line. It goes in, it goes in a straight line. Unless something acts on it to change its direction. And you wake up tomorrow morning and it's going to be the same as today. And Monday's going to be the same as Friday was. And Tuesday will be the same as Monday was. Because life goes on like that. If you're happy with that, then that's fine. But I don't think you are, you wouldn't be here tonight. For something to be different, you've got to change something. You've got to take action that changes the direction you're going in. Newton's first law of motion. An object at rest remains at rest. And an object in motion continues in a straight line unless it's acted upon by, by a, another force. This is the laws of physics. You can't change it. Your life, you've got to today. I'm going to tell you something. Every single thing you've done in your life today, up to, to now, up to today, has brought you here in this room tonight. It could well have brought you here for a reason. Now you've heard strategies and things today. It doesn't matter how many courses you go on. It doesn't matter how many strategies you do. If you haven't got that right. If you haven't got the mindset. If you're still labouring on the limiting beliefs, you're not going to be successful. And the likelihood is that if you did have that right mindset, you wouldn't be here tonight. So I'm guessing that pretty well most of us here tonight could do with some extra information. But remember, information isn't king. It's the action you take with the information that's king that makes a change. Am I right? We've seen people do massive, massive things differently coming on our course. I've been running these um, money magnet things for about five years now. Freddie's perfect example. Struggling, tried to get into property, spent fortune on courses. They didn't work out because they didn't, they told him what to do, not how to do it. He lost money. He came to me. We did a, he did a 12 month mentoring course with me within two years millionaire. He's now my business partner. Because I'm not going to let talent like that get away, am I? So, on free land and property, you get these free. And we'll just pick them out. Okay, Freddie will look after that and tell me when it stopped dinging. They are, they're coming in, look. Thank you. So that's a good deal. You're going to get a free book. If you want to spend £29 and learn it, oh, incidentally, for that £29, we give you a 100% money back guarantee. So if you're not happy with the day, we'll even give you a 29 quid back. We're not trying to make money out of you. All right? 
busy. That's him, look. <laughs> it's, that's the word, there, look, there, there, there. It's them, look, there. <laughs> Try to get it to come through. <laughs> the point is, look, I'll speak to you as, as you're dialing and you're trying to get through and that. The point is, making money is easy. It's very, very easy. I'm going to tell you another story. When I went, first got to Jersey, I worked for a guy who was a multimillionaire. And he came, kind of became my mentor. And he used to tell me stuff, and a lot of stuff, and, and a lot of it sank in. The centre of Jersey is a square called the Royal Square. Anybody been to Jersey? Mm. The square called the Royal Square. And I remember one hot sunny day in 1969, I was in this square. And there was a, a UK registered Rolls Royce, brand new, parked in the, in, in the Royal Square. And it didn't have Jersey plates, all, all Jersey number plates start with a J uh, and some numbers. This was a UK registration. And I remember looking at that on this hot sunny day, this number plate. And the number plate read, too easy. I remember standing there and thinking, I wonder what his secret is. How can we spend all that money on a brand new roller, He's in Jersey, you don't get there, you know, without a lot of money if you, if you go in the right way. And he's got, he's, he's got the audacity to put on his roller the number plate too easy. I thought, I wonder what his secret is. He knows something that I don't know. And I thought, that, I used to I think about that all the time. And then it was, when I was, got into property in, in Jersey again later in 1986, and I used to go into my wife and I used to say, you know what, this is so easy. And then so Yes, he's right. Making money is easy. Very, very easy. But you've got to get that right. Because money won't come to you if you don't respect it, if you don't love it. I'm thinking money is the root of all evil, filthy rich and all that. He's not respecting money. Why would it go to you when you, when you, when you think that about it? You have to change <coughs> your way of thinking as regards money. You have to love money, you have to love what money can do for you, and you have to love what you can do for other people when you've got money. And then you'll see a change. Then you'll see money come in. I'm going to tell you something else as well, because remember I said the secret to success, to success is self-belief and focus. You've got to have self-belief, but self-belief without the focus is nothing. Now I'm going to tell you something. That stage, me, the roof, the walls, Cuthbert, when you break everything down to its tiny, 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 smallest bit, do you know what it is? It's energy. Who said that, you? Who said energy? Someone say energy? Yeah. It's two sparks of energy. I forgot to say, answer that, Freddie. <laughs> There's two sparks of energy. And they go round and round each other like that. There's a positive one and a negative one. The positive one is called an iron, that's called an anion. But they're not solid things, they're sparks of energy, nothing more. The strangest thing in the entire universe is just made up of little bits of energy. But they are. You get enough of these little things together and form atoms. You get enough atoms together, they, 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 they form elements. You get enough elements together, they form compounds. Enough compounds to form what we are. But at the end of the day, it's energy. And what does energy give off? Energy waves. Like the sun gives off sun, sunlight. You've got radio waves, gamma waves, beta waves, TV waves, everything. All these different energy waves coming out and flying around the universe. Now, because we're alive, we give off energy as well. We give off energy in the form of heat. You know, you, you, you feel, and the harder you work, the more energy you give off, the hotter you get. What's the hottest part of your body? Does anybody know? It's your head. The reason is, that's where your brain is, that's where you do all this energy, all this thinking. Now, when you're thinking, you're giving off thought waves which go out and travel anywhere, because you're not directing them anywhere, so they just go out and jumble around the universe. But how often 
Have you been thinking about somebody and two minutes later they call you? Happens to everybody. And far too often for it to be a convenience, to, 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 be, to be a coincidence. Happens to everybody. You think about them and they call you and say, that's funny, I was just thinking about you. Right? Happens. The thing is, you can train yourself to do that. Within a week of focusing on somebody, it can't be the Pope, it's got to be somebody who knows you, got your number, you can get them to call you. And within a week, you'll be 95, 96% success rate on doing that. And it becomes a game in the end, because you think, oh, I'll get so-and-so to call me. And you just focus on them, you just imagine them. Picture their face, picture your, your thought waves going out into their head. And see how quickly they call you. And then it becomes a bit of a game, because you think, yeah, I can do this any time I like. But then you start thinking, if I can do that with my brain, what else can I do? If I can get people to call me just by me thinking about it, focusing on them, what else can I get to come to me just by focusing on it? And I'll tell you what the answer is. Anything you like. Anything, as long as it's legal, moral, and ethical, you can have it. Now, the reason you've got a job, because that's what you're focused on. If your parents have said to you, work hard at school, become an entrepreneur and a millionaire, you'll be here tonight. And if you've been telling your kids, work hard and get a good job and you'll be okay, you want to change that and tell them something different. Because you're, you're, getting, you're limiting them otherwise. It's going off, isn't it? It is. <laughs> That's brilliant. As soon as it stops, we'll, we'll pick some name, we'll pick some, uh, some out at random and we'll, we'll, we'll get a few prizes out. Um, I'm going to run out of things to say in a minute. But that's brilliant. Thanks everybody for doing this, by the way. Look, for 29 quid, you need to come on this Money Magnet Day. I promise you, it, it, it really will change your mind. It'll change the way you think about life, it'll change the way you approach stuff, and it will certainly change the amount of success you get. There's no question about it. We're not selling stuff, we don't, we're not doing that to make money. 29 quid, it just about covers our expenses. And like I say, if you don't like it, we'll just give you 29 quid back. We're not short for 29 quid, right? We could do it for free, but like Freddie says, people don't appreciate things for free. Things that are free have got no value. So we charge 29 quid, as, just, you know, as a gesture. And at the bottom it's got our email address there. Uh, I've just got our website, thepropertymillionaireacademy.co.uk. If you go on there, go through uh, the top bar to training. There's a drop-down menu, you go to the bottom of training, it's got money magnet. You can book on there, 29 quid. We'd love to see you there. If you get any problems with booking or anything else like that, you've got my number. Call me. It's not, it's not a you know, fake number, it's my own personal mobile. And. Uh, the mere fact that I'm happy to give up my personal mobile should speak volumes about the kind of company we are. We're not one of those people you can't get hold of, you know, or you're going through a secretary and all that nonsense. That's my personal mobile. Pick, pick one of my Freddie, any, anyone. Open it. Who is it? Della. D Delia. <laughs> Dealer. Who's Dealer? Here you are. Come and get it. Come and get it. Give me another one, Freddie. Give me another one. Tap of me at Gmail. <laughs> Take your pick. Take your pick. Oh, it's been great speaking to you. I really enjoy talking. I really enjoy teaching people and helping people to be successful. I get my kit. I don't need to do this. You know, I've got more than enough money to not have to worry about anything. I'm 70 this year. I don't have to worry about doing this. I don't have to do it. I do it because I love doing it. I do it because I love... I'm a creative type of people, I like doing stuff, I like making stuff. And I love taking people who, who, who need some help and nurturing and making them successful. I like bragging rights. I want bragging rights over you lot, right? I want to say, there's Karen, there's him, and there's her. Sorry, I don't know your names. And they came along on our money magnet day, and now look at them. Successful people. And anybody can be successful. You don't have to be specially ordained or appointed. Anybody can do it. Nobody had a worse upbringing than me, and I did it. Freddie, you know Freddie's story. He did it. You can do it. Your first step is to get yourself on that money magnet day. Spend your 29 quid, 
and come along and we'll change your life for you. Great to meet you. Thank you.